you know, I just, I loved him as a person and as an artist. And also uh, him and I saw Tupac in Switzerland in like 2007 and he wasn't yes. dead. And uh, we yelled Thug Life and he turned around and I hid behind Bren. And uh, to this day, I stand by it, it was him. Ah, I'm recording. Whoa, I'm leaving. That's very subtle, Tom. Yeah. Um, no, it's not. How did you know I was in Montenegro? Ah, oh, maybe I told you guys. This guy. Or is it the, uh... It's the... Yeah. You, got yeah. a very nice, you got a very nice Montenegro tan. Yeah, you don't even look Swedish, bro. Look, it's half a tan, and then I touched up the uh, the Zoom, whatever. You know how the touch-up shit? It's all 50% right now. With blush or digital? Both. Both. Digital Both blush. Digital. How's my volume? Your volume is perfect. <laughs> Hey, you came in. At, you came in like a pro with the palm trees and stuff like that as well. So, hey man, I, I couldn't bear sitting in the office today. You know, it's just beautiful out here. <laughs> <laughs> good, uh, huh? What were you guys saying before I connected? I'm so curious. I was asking if you were up, maybe out kayaking or hiking or whatever the fuck you guys do nowadays. Yeah, and, um, yeah. But Tom said you're probably home just jerking off. Well, what I did is I joined the call early and left it on while I was jerking off early. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping you guys caught that. I did. <laughs> Sweet. You're, are you, you're basically here to promote your uh, your brands of uh, clothes, right? No, I didn't even, I, honestly, I didn't even realize I put this shirt on this morning. Now that I'm, uh, I can take it off if you want. Hey! <laughs> I'm at the beach, so it's weird that I'm wearing a shirt. It is. Yeah. What's up, bros? I saw Roger Waters last night. It was fucking amazing. Cool, man. My friends bought the tickets three years ago and, like, were supposed to bring their wives, and it just kept getting postponed, and then neither of their wives wanted to go, so they brought me and my wife, and so last minute, just had a fucking blast. It was like a proper, I haven't been to an arena rock show in so long. and Man, I can't remember the last time. Dude was like hyper political. It was crazy because it was in Miami. So, you know, like politics are pretty skewed one way. But there was just like this giant, like four way jumbotron screen that like moved up and down. And it was really fucking cool, man. All right. So the, the reason the reason why I asked you guys to do this is uh, because uh, I've been doing these interviews for the last year and I thought it was it could be interesting to like jump into uh, a little bit more personal accolades you know like are we going all music or are we doing you know all over the place because I've got a couple of things in mind but you can uh, you can choose whatever suits you fine Marcus <laughs> yeah I was going all music and then the Lewis Logic episode inspired me to think about a movie so you know I do have two musics one movie if that Ooh, works perfect. that's perfect uh, but let's, let's start with the one that is like the first one that popped into your mind. Uh, maybe you start with Marcus. The first guy I wanted to mention is uh, Alias, who we all know or knew. Uh, unfortunately, he you know he passed away a few years ago. But I always felt that he's one of the guys that you know I feel like he never really got the recognition he deserved from most of the work. He I mean he did and he didn't. He did on sort of an underground level, but being you know the one of the creators of Anticon and uh, you know this the stuff that he did before his solo shit like the you know the uh, so-called artists and the um, the live poets and all that stuff that's really good but when I really got into to Alias uh, both as a rapper and a producer was uh, the you know Deep Puddle Dynamics that and a few other records just really changed the way I, I looked at music in general you have Maybe, you know, Cold Flow, Funk Crusher Plus, you have, you know, Cannibal Ox, and then you have whatever Anticon was doing. And Deep Puddle is one of those things that when I first listened to it, that's one of the things that really made me think, like, what the fuck is this, you know? And it's so different from anything I ever listened to before. Only a few other records really applies to that. But it, it really, um, yeah, I really got into that. And then, of course, I mean, both as a rapper and producer, he was, you know, he was there. He's, part of a, something that's really was really big uh, you know in the underground but then you know he went on to do his solo records i can't really say that i got into you know the other side of the looking glass that much it's a good record but i feel like it's it lacks in you know mixing perhaps and mastering but you know it, it's it's one of those records that together with the other stuff that it did really um should be mentioned but the standout for me is i think uh, muted the, the next record it did 
when he was more, you know, um, more of a producer. I'm not saying that I didn't like him as a rapper, but his production really evolved. And it became one of those things that when you heard one of his songs, you, you fucking knew there was him. Uh, whether it's, you know, he was doing, you know, the soul stuff, it's Selling Live Water. That's just insane. Like the songs they had on that one. I mean, I can just listen to them still to this day over and over. Uh, and, and, you know, some of the Sage stuff and all that. But Mute is really a record where I feel like it took a, a step into becoming something bigger than perhaps Anticon. And, uh, and the few records he did after that that I got into are, you know, equally good. But I think Mute would have been the, the prime for me. But, you know, um, I feel like he's one of those guys who deserves more, more recognition. If, uh, if people don't know about him, go check him out. Go check out anything he's done with Anticon and, uh, and produce it for other people. What I, what I can add to that is like, I remember you rapping on tour with us. Yeah, on that yeah, I was gonna say that. Close, on that Eyes Closed EP uh, on one of those songs. And for me till this day, his, my favorite thing that he ever done is that EP. Like it gives me a weird flashback of that like George Bush era where, where like everybody was talking about that and how crazy that was. It's something so periodical, but still like I play until this day, I play that from Alias's catalog. That's the EP that I, that I play yeah. here in the store. And yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. yeah I, I go back to that one. I go back to Muted and the, what is it, Lillian, the next one it did. So, the, you know, there are a few records that I get into and I can just listen to them over and over. And, and, and again, when I hear him, when I listen to his shit, it's just like, you kind of drop what you're doing and you're just like, oh, this, this really hits home, you know? But yeah, that, that one song that we kept doing, because back then, you know, we just kept switching up fucking dumb songs and doing covers of others, whatever fucking, uh, milkshake you know you know everyone was doing it all the time we just kept switching it up because it was so dumb but that's one that always like it stayed with us for years and it was always one of the best uh you know songs we did live did you say milkshake and was bird drinking a milkshake it's a, uh, i'm not drinking a milkshake no for the record it's a pina colada um if i could add you know uh first of all personally i a million percent agree with everything you're saying and uh Bren was one of the first dudes to like, uh, you know, I was an Anticon fanboy. They used to like make fun of me. Um, those dudes were the best, you know, and, you know, as you said, changed everything. And he was one of the first dudes of that like caliber that, uh, you know, when I met him, just like fucking welcomed me. It was just like meeting one of you guys, you know, welcomed me into his home, into his studio in Oakland, gave me some of the best production to this day, you know. He produced on my first album, produced on my second album, and those are songs that I like. I go back to, and you know, I can't believe that I was like uh, working with artists like that at that time in my life and my career. And uh, you know, it's pretty amazing. He and if he were still alive today, you know, I, I think he'd be producing for pop stars, Dua Lipa, stuff like that, because he was always just on the cutting edge and. You know, like you were saying through the looking glass, like for me back then, lyrics were everything and I was just like pouring over every fucking word. But then, you know, as he came into his own, his uh, studio, you know, skill and his mixing and his editing, everything, it just came like it sharpened so much. And uh, he was one of the first dudes that made me like really pay attention to production and details where, you know, before I was more lyric oriented. but. Uh, it just was so dense and, you know, I just, I loved him as a person and as an artist. And also uh, him and I saw Tupac in Switzerland in like 2007 and he yes, wasn't yes. there. And uh, we yelled thug life and he turned around and I hid behind Bren. And uh, to this day I stand by it. It was him. No fucking facts. It's facts. He was also the first guy that we uh, played in Ancien Belgique with. Because uh, I have that weird picture where both me and him are sweating very, very hard. It's very, it's a very weird <laughs> yeah, yeah. because it's the only picture I have of him and me together. And when somebody like when when he died and you want to post up a picture of of him with yeah. you together, Couldn't it's like, like oh, not, not this picture because like super two super sweaty dudes. <laughs> we're sweaty guys, man. <laughs> Let's be real. Like all of us were, all of us were Anticon nerds in our own yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was into the East Coast shit and the Def Jux and everything too. But like, you know. We wouldn't like, imagine, like, and also, and also, like from like from their best songs, like the the, the song on Muted with with uh, Marcus Aker from the No Twist is insane, like amazing. He, he produced, if if I'm correctly, he's produced Sea Lion on Sage Francis's album as well, right? He did uh, another amazing album. fucking yeah. song, yeah. And uh, and did he he did Plutonium as well? 
he did plutonium i think and uh, slow cold drops yeah he What's did a lot that? of that album and then i'll just tell him live water and uh, yeah. Pluton yeah. plutonium for me is like the ultimate soul song ever yeah. like it's, it's yeah. like, for me that's the that's every the, yeah. a lot of the ultimate soul songs were produced by by alias yeah know? yeah and what what was like you 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 probably know better than I do, Jacques. Is uh, how uh, what was his part in like producing Deep Puddle? Was he was he producer? Was he a producer on that as well? I, you know, honestly, I would have to look back, but okay. I think it was a little bit of everybody. That was a lot of uh, Controller Seven back in those days, DJ Mayonnaise. I don't know if he was producing, um, but you know, he was definitely rapping, and uh, we used to like that was like the like the gun porn for him. You know, like he would go back and he would just be like. I'm um, in this verse is so cringe and I would just be like, no, I fucking love it. It's amazing. <laughs> Same when, you know, when people come to us and they want to talk about, I'm just like, Hey man, that was an amazing time. But like, if I really go back and listen, I'm like, some of it's pretty cringy of the shit I said. And, uh, he felt that way about deep puddle. Oh really? Um, yeah. You know, those dudes were super young and they just like, you know, I don't think they really knew slug that well. And they all just kind of like, they got together, you know, and just like made this record in a matter of a few days, oh, and, well. you know, a few sessions I mean, back and forth. The chemistry on that record is just, perfect you know like it's fucking perfect yeah it's amazing. Together. but i will say i do think that alias did produce not that it really matters but he did produce some of that because if you listen to through the looking glass or the other side of looking glass uh a bunch of songs are very similar in terms of like, same feeling. vibe yeah yeah, yeah. And, and that's the feeling with alias you can listen to whatever it is whether it's like his early stuff with a lot of samples or the latest stuff with you know more live instruments yeah. there's a feeling there and you just identify it in a second I think I think like like what the what Jell used to have with the with the MPC drumming, like twelve the uh, SP twelve hundred. Or the, yeah 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 sorry. <laughs> uh, um, You're the gear I, guy. I think Alias I think Alias had the, the, like the that very uh, signature drum roll that he had in his, in yes. his drums. It was like that yeah. that kind of like like DJ Shadow had also like a very specific way of like cutting drums, and I think Alias had that as well. A swing to it. Yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, good uh, good call, Marcus. That's uh, one that we probably can all agree on because uh, he uh, yeah he's he's somebody that nobody named yet, and also it's uh, I think it's, it's definitely a guy that deserves more recognition because until this day in the shop, if somebody asks me for instrumental hip hop, which is always like the Mad Lips or the Nightmare on Wax or like all that all that kind of stuff, he never gets named, and I think he's like him and Six Two. Are two of those names that I could like easily like say listen to this and like it still stands up after like 20 years so it's a uh, absolutely yeah, good. yeah okay uh, let's move to the first one that Jacques wanted to name oh I'm up now um, for me it was a no-brainer um, it's Grand Buffet hey um, that was on my list love those guys it had to be on your list I mean you know uh, all Anticon also, but for real, Grand Buffet is the reason that all of us met because I was, you know, at the festival with them in Paris at Sol La Plage when wait, we're all was Caveman Speak and Stacks playing. Yeah, yeah, we did that. Yeah. We did that shit when we do like five sets. Yeah, with different people in one hour. Oh, geez. Was that, was that really that? good at that too? Yeah, yeah, and you know, it was a huge festival, and I was watching you guys play, and I just happened to be on tour with Grand Buffet, and I was standing uh, next to Johan in the crowd, and I was just like, "Oh, like, are you?" He had emailed me, I think, on MySpace. And we were like, you know, supposed to get some beats together, never did, and I was just like, "Yo, I'm that Bluebird dude from Florida," and he was like, "What the fuck are you doing here?" And uh, that's the day I broke my foot, and I probably never saw you guys again. And then, you know, we found each other on the internet. But I digress. Grand Buffet, um, two badass motherfuckers from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I met them, man, I want to say 99. I was touring with a rap rock band, and we had the same booking agent on the East Coast of the United States. And, you know, we were pretty into our shit into you know all kinds of rap music and the booking agent was just like hey i have this this group and they came down to orlando to play with us and i just i'll never forget the first time seeing those two standing in will's pub and all of us were looking at each other like who the fuck are these guys and what are they about to do and i always say that you know that it's a shame that they missed the mark by a few years as far as like digital proof, you know, like Instagram, social media in general was, you know, it was like a thing, but not like it is now. So there really isn't any proper documentation of the magic 
of fucking Grand Buffet. You know, like what all of us saw those two dudes do, like from major festival stages, you know, Sola Plage, Pukul Pop, in front of thousands of people to just like the tiniest, rattiest bars and venues, like what you can imagine around the world. Like those dudes straight up made magic. You know, like they taught me all my chops. You know, they took me on my first tours, took me to Europe first, but, uh, you know, removing me from the picture, like what those dudes did specifically on stage was like nothing short of amazing. And there is not a lot of footage you can dig around on YouTube and you can find a few things. Uh, you know, there's some DVDs floating around, but it was never really captured. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a damn shame, you know. It's and, hands, down, hands down the best life act I've ever seen in my life. I sure. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's just insane. And, and there's one thing to listen to their stuff on, well, I have CDs, you know, I, have yeah, shit on CDs. I, don't, I don't want to get rid of it, you know, because it's just, where, where can I find that stuff otherwise? But you, you listen to that and it's fun and it's, you know, it, it's cool, but then you see them live and it's just like, it's insane. It's it insane. I put you in that category too, Jack. It's like to go into a room where people don't give a fuck about you and, you know, they're all against you, but you've got them like turned around within a couple of minutes. It's amazing to see. It's really amazing to see. I 100% learn from them, you know. Right. Yeah, also with the comedy that they, like the, the way they approach it. Like I, yeah, I, I, I booked a, a mini tour for them once uh, here in Belgium together with us. I think it was with Skinny Drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we, played, we, played, we played three shows. We played one in Abbey. We played one in Kortrijk. And the first one was in Leuven. And that was like a, a weird squat. And they would pull the opposite of what they would do in the States, which is like, they would be like super offensive American to like mm -hmm. pull the crowd in and then make it so ridiculous so the crowd actually noticed that they are joking. But that's how they grabbed them. And they told, I heard stories of them like being in the States and like a, a redneck bar or whatever and doing like exactly the opposites of what they did at that thing just to, to grab people's attention. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, like, you know, production wise, there were no slouches either in their own right. Um, you know, they were sampling just like early synth and also playing live music and you know like they, they played instruments they were masters of sampling like the production on the records like you know when they put out sparkle classic in 2003 that's like uh that's the first record i learned of them and that was like really fun and kind of jokey but that like trill was called the trilogy of terror it was uh undercover angels pittsburgh hearts and cigarette beach i think i got that in the wrong order but the production was fucking crazy you know like and, and it was, they were on the edge of like making really progressive music, but at the same time was funny and it was political and it was just fucking dope. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time they toured with every major like indie left field hip hop artist from Soul to Sage, like, to, you know, they played with Slug, they played with everybody. Then they went on tour with like Of Montreal, MGMT. Wesley Willis, dude, Wesley they Willis. Told me yeah. that I blind. I was on the tour with Wesley Willis, which is fucking, it's a whole other story in itself. Like <laughs> I did about the first seven days. Um, but I mean, you know, they toured with every major act and they were in front of so many stages. Man, I saw, I don't know where it was. It was in Paris, another stage in Paris, like, I don't know, thousands of people. And they came on stage, like you were saying, with an American flag. And like, they never did this in America. and. In French, Lord Grunge asked how many people speak German. And it was just kind of like that. quiet mumbling. And he pointed at the American flag and he was like, you're welcome. And they were like shocked. And they just went into a song and the whole crowd started jumping. But I mean, <laughs> like amazing. Yeah. And yeah. you know, in the small redneck bars where people are literally like trying to order ribs with their family. Like, I mean, just the craziest sh yeah. shit. I think, I think we have all con another connection with Grand Buffet that I kind of forgot about. Didn't Lord Grunge produce Easy Tiger? He did. Lord Grunge did produce oh, Easy Tiger. But wait, but wait a minute. I'll do you one better. Alias produced a song featuring uh, Lord Grunge. Yeah. Was, right. Yeah. yeah well, absolutely. They were, they were dear homies and toured together as well. Yes. Crazy. Yeah. Exactly. You know, at, at one point, um, Soul and Alias were pushing very hard for Anticon to sign Grand Buffet. At the same time, it was right after Kasloppy Doctor came out, like shortly after Sparkle Classic officially came out, and both Soul and Alias were pitching both those records to Anticon. Can you, you, know. can, you uh, can you tell more about what happened to? Uh... Honestly, I don't know. We lost touch. Um, I know they did this really cool 
the, one of the last big productions they did, did you ever see they did the Pittsburgh Batman? It was a live play that would run once a year. There's a DVD of it somewhere. And uh, I believe Sage starred in it the second year as the as Bane, <laughs> which is hilarious. But it was a whole like live action play that they would do around Christmas time. And they did it a few years and like kept adding to it. And I'm talking like a full on production and they would sell out like a weekend of runs, like two shows a night, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, that was back a couple of years ago. And, you know, they're both still active, uh, but separately. They released, uh, they were supposed to do a children's album called like Fox and Bear or something like that. And it never came out. That, that um, would make so much sense if they did. Yeah, cause yeah, they so could, much they, sense. This would be like yeah. a kid's, you know, performing act. And that yeah, would remember be. Let's Go Find the Cat was like the kid's yeah. song. That oh, was like yeah, yeah. Let's go find Let's go find the cat. I forgot. It was the one that they were so fucking tired of playing that everybody always wanted to hear because it's like how they learned of them. You know, that you, was you, you were on. You were one of my favorite Grand Buffet songs, like the America's one. Is America's. It? Yeah. Do you think we'd be able to perform that now, or would we have to rewrite a little bit of the lyrics? <laughs> like, uh, uh, no, I mean it's. It, it was written from like it was obviously written from a, a perspective of one of those dudes, right? So sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't necessarily think you should. I don't know. It still stands up, but like maybe you're right. Like I think some of that that stuff maybe didn't age that well. <laughs> this morning I thought of "Fuck Me," this first song Lord Grunge produced for me. Um, you know, Bluebird is a million MCs better. Fuck me, that's such a ridiculous song. That was like, so when I was the band that I met Grand Buffet, in, the the rap rock band that I was in was called the Nature Kids, <laughs> and I had dreadlocks, and that's how they met me, and I. Like gave up everything to go on this national nature kids. This is in 1999. Like gave up everything. Like broke up with my girlfriend, broke my lease, dropped out of college, sold my car. Like jumped in this RV, and I wasn't even in the band. I was just like, a, I featured on a few songs, and I would like, you know, I was kind of like a roadie merch guy, and I would also perform. That tour broke up in California. We were like literally like waiting on a record deal. You know, like there were deals being signed and people arguing. And while that was happening, the band broke up and I was like on my way home and had a few dates with grunge with grand buffet. And I was just like, I'm going to stay in Pittsburgh because I had nowhere to fucking go. So I just went to grand buffet's house and grunge was like, Hey man, like I support bluebird as a solo artist. Like I'll produce some songs for you. We'll put you on some shows. And like, I mean, they literally like, if you name those things, like that's kind of like, Stuff that's in the back of my head and I completely forgot about, but it's same. If, same. If you go on tour with 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 more acts, and it's one of those acts that you want to see every evening again. And yeah, because it like, was always fucking stuff. different every night. Oh, yeah, another very good call. Yes. So the the one the one that I was gonna name for as the first one is somebody that you guys maybe have less of a connection with, but it's but it's somebody that I immediately like as like top five MCs and that is not like named anywhere ever. Is a uh, bird of prey uh, from yeah. uh, from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. I met him uh, in 2008 in uh, in Winnipeg. We became friends. He's a uh, first of all uh, an extreme record collector who's been uh, a part of Discogs for a couple of years, so he knows shit about records. And uh, I want to talk uh, specifically about this one record that I made with him in uh, 2010 called Catch an L. He took records over the la like last five years before that, he basically made instrumentals out of one loop. So it was one loop and I went in there and we, we set up in his kitchen on his SP404 and he just like let the loop play and he rapped on it like without backups or anything like that. And within within like three hours, we, we recorded, uh, I think a 25 song album. And till this day on the Marathon of Dope label, which I used to run back in the day, we released over, I think, 50 records and till this day it's my favorite record that ever came out on, on, on Marathon of Dope. Except for me doing a very poor job at like recording his vocals and recording <laughs> the instrumentals and like just like trying to help him out with the limited skills that I had. I can still listen to that record every day and like I can still like the, I think the the strength of what Bird is doing I can still find out with maybe it's because of like English being my second language but I can still find out new lines and like how well it's put together every time I listen to that record. He has like of like kind of the way of approaching lyrics the way an MF Doom would do. Like, but he also has the persona of like being, even if he's only like 45, he he feels like this old man that is rapping about like 
fucking super cool subjects and the coolest way and like he can like everything he touches is gold i would have to have a conversation with with people from winnipeg or like from canada to to uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i think at some point his career kind of popped off a little bit but then it didn't and like i think like he's one of the most like for me is one of the most underrated music guys like in general like not only as an mc yeah. but also as a producer and also as like the way his interest is in music and like marcus you met him as well when we were in toronto Toronto like, a few years ago, yeah. the way he showed us around the city and like knows everything yeah. about record stores and about like how a community is put together like when it comes to records i, I saw him talking to a record owner a record store owner about like you should check out this old record because this break from this album mm -hmm. and like like check out the album catch an l and um i would say what's that record he made with rob crooks uh oh yeah yeah of course was it called his rough out but that's something else what is it it's called argyle and it's like a concept record about like going to high school and it's also amazing like it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's produced by it's produced by rob crooks but it's uh like like i said like a bird of prey used to come come in and like he he he, his voice is so thick and like deep and and nice like on the mic that he's like his lyrics book and he just like rambled off that rap and like in the end look at me and like yeah we got it it's fine let's do the let's do the next one and it's a fucking perfect take there's no backups nothing like there's no no ad libs nothing 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 his voice is like not going down in the middle of a song or whatever he's just like this fucking constant guy and like he keeps his cool he never like puts in more energy he just like sounds exactly the way he needs to sound so yeah. And I mean, maybe it's because it's like uh, somebody that I, you know, that I know and that I like and, you know, like, but I think he deserves more people listening to Catch an L. And I think, like, I would suggest, like, going to Spotify and checking that album out from the beginning till the end. You'll you'll find definitely a couple of songs that you like. So will do. Yeah. I mean, you know, as far as Canada goes, his name holds a lot of weight as like one of the OGs. <clears throat> peanuts and corn and correct me i think peanuts and corn is from winnipeg but bird of prey is from vancouver mm -hmm. and I, I even think at one point he was called like uh canada's most like best underrated rapper yeah it's exclaim it's thomas quinlan you know the the also what is and and he is one of the g's you know i think the dude who got more popular with that style was obviously buck 65 but there's like this cool canadian thing where like they were able to maintain these like old men personas with like that, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, Epic, yeah. Buck 65, Bird of Prey. What was the other dude that was kind Bird of like Bolt. Buck 65? Uh, Governor Bolts. Mm -hmm. Y'all, you know Governor Bolts? Yeah, that's another one of the, that's another one of those names. That's that's one There's of the so guys. much amazing yeah. Canadian rap that like you know it was there was this weird thing back in our. But that's like, that's the thing. Know, that's the thing as well, as well. Like like what what McEnroe did uh, with with peanuts and corn like again another an amazing producer and like yeah. that's another thing that I, rem I remember that this goes back to i'm talking soul seek days <laughs> i'm talking late uh, yeah. 90s when i used to like i used to meet people uh in music through the chat on soul seek because their collection was the same as mine yeah. like, uh, i still have a couple of friends like left from those days and anti you had anticon and you had peanuts and corn in some way as well next to death jux it was yeah. way smaller of course but like Somebody like Pip's kid and stuff like that, who who I got in touch with in 2007, which was already, I think I was listening to his music for like eight years before that. And my brother was very into that because it, they were very political in another way than a lot of other rap was because they were talking about um, social issues without being too political. So it was more about like, uh, we're, not, we're not necessarily black and ghettos or whatever, but we're talking about like poor people who live in Canada stuff Last you word. know yeah, yeah. like being being like very real about like their lyrics about we grew up in, in this kind of area and we we just like like just just the idea of they were talking about all stuff that they knew and that that was the thing that like for me stood out was like that that's basically what anticon was doing as well they were talking about subject matter that you were like okay i can relate to this i can do this kind of music apparently because those guys are talking about subject matter like being broke and being like you know uh being in school and like not fitting in with with people like without being corny and shit like that but, like you know it, it was it was done so well and peanuts and corn deserves a lot of credit when it comes to that as well McEnroe brought a lot of those acts together and i mean bird of prey had a history of vancouver rap before that which i'm 
see i should have looked at this up look because I, I i i can't say too much about that like i'm talking more about like bird of prey as like the area that i know i'm from mm-hmm. um we had a couple of uh bird of prey features especially with my speed l7 project afterwards and every time he killed it like there was if you ask something from him it's always going to be like it's going to be solid like it's going to be good and you know it's going to be one take and oh i only have a shitty mic and i'm like yeah even with a shitty mic you know he's going to sound better than anybody else you got it it's- but i feel like there in terms of the um, like canadian scene all the guys we're talking about right now there was like a simplicity in the way they made music more so maybe on the instrumental side because mm-hmm. remember at that time everybody was trying to be fucking weird and and do like very intrinsic weird stuff you know even us included of course but you listen to their stuff and it's just straight you know it's straight like you say there's no that comes, that comes necessarily any ad libs no backups or anything like that you know you just had the uh the, the loops the beats and it's always straight and it's always kind of easy to listen to compared to a lot of shit that i was in you and me like i'm not talking about you jacques because but, but you have a little bit of different background and you are a little bit older than us but for me it always comes down to like we got into rap because of a mike Latt and and uh, dev jux and like not, not into rap but like into making rap yeah yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we got yeah, into yeah. wu-tang and stuff like that but yeah. what what triggered us to make music is like acts like the uh dj shadow um dev jux anti-com and i think the difference with penis and corn is that they came from uh they're a little bit older than us like all those guys are are like my age 10 years older and they come yeah. from a background of making music in the beginning of the 90s and like yeah. i know like patrick's uh favorite mc is somebody like uh cool modi somebody that bird of prey named for this program is a uh, is uh, roxanne chante for instance so it's like you know they, they come from a different background but like i think the the thing that connects us all is not only the underground but also the way you specifically uh choose your content within an underground you had a lot of MCs who wanted to rap about like being lyrical and being this and that and this and we were talking more specifically about being like you know I go outside of my house and i don't feel uh comfortable in where i live or like you know that kind of stuff and i think yeah. that's something that connected all those different bands even even though like there's no connection for me between peanuts and corn and anticon anticon was way more uh, uh experimental as peanuts and corn just wanted to do rap and the way yeah. they wanted to do rap like what i think uh, peanuts and corn did so well and i'm going back like i know patrick is not agreeing with this uh, but like something like fermented reptile that record him and him and gruff my brother was listening to that record and my brother wasn't even listening to rap at the moment like he was listening to punk but fermented reptile put it so well together about being broke and being like you know like being against like uh major corporations and stuff like that in the beginning of the 2000s when the whole uh, anti-globalist movement movement was existing uh, that those subject matters were so important and peanuts and corn and fermented reptile specifically did this so well i could say peanuts and corn as well but i, I choose to say bird of prey because of his specific uh, skill sets but you know like you know I'm going to go back and listen to some of his catalog because I only know, you know, a few songs from him. I think I think for I, I keep on naming Catch and L, not because I produced it, because I, ne- I, <laughs> I, I no, no, seriously, I have nothing to do with that record. Like it was his samples. It was so bi- it w- I was just the guy with the mic never came out on vinyl. It came out. It came out on like maybe 20, 20 CDs or 50 CDs or whatever. Afterwards, I lost all the beats. So I had to remake the beats afterwards for playing live <laughs> because of fucking a hard drive died or whatever. So um, just just that that specific way of like how romantic that story is, is like for me, like a good memory and a, and definitely something that I would like. It's still on Spotify and stuff like that. So you can still find it. Oh, yeah.